What we're going to do is I'm going to give a, a little overview. I'm assuming that a lot of you know a lot about Brazil and some of you know very little and I wanted to kind of bring us up to speed a little bit. I'm going to speak about 10 minutes and then each of our panelists will be speaking about 10 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions and discussions. So um, as you all know, or maybe you don't know, but in the, in the election recently there were, now well, this is just jumping ahead. Is that because it did something wrong? Probably not. We're okay. There were 13 candidates, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, there were 13 candidates for the presidency. There are over 36 parties and 28 of which were in the Congress in the elections. And the first round of the elections was on October 7th. And Brazilian law requires that if no one gets a majority of the votes, of actually valid votes that are cast, there's a second round of the election, which was held on the 28th. Now, in the first round, the contents in which this occurred, I don't know why it's popping forward, was that in polls previous to the first round of the election, the, most, the lead candidate was Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, former president of Brazil, originally a trade union activist, who had been indicted and convicted of allegedly uh, receiving an apartment in a beach resort area for favors given to a construction company. And, um, Unusual, usually, uh, justice is very slow in Brazil, but the courts decided to speed up the uh, appeal of his decision to the second, uh, to the appeals level, and he was convicted, and his, his uh, nine-year sentence was increased to 12 years, and this meant that he was il unable to participate in the elections, according to the majority interpretation of a law called the Clean Slate Law. So he was imprisoned in uh, April of this year, eliminating his possibility of being a candidate for the presidency, even though his, the polls show that he was the leading candidate at the time. Uh, and so he chose as his substitute uh, to replace him, uh, a, a person I'll talk about in a minute, Fernando Haddad. I think the most important thing to understand about these elections is, as in the United States and other countries, fake news and the media has played a very, very important role. And it, we've understood now in the, in the, in the weeks since the election that and a, a little before the end of the election, that WhatsApp, which is, an, uh, which is a media uh, telephone and communications uh, application, which is very, very popular in Brazil, over 100 million people use it, was receiving and transmitting hundreds of millions of messages which were outrageously false, accusing people of anything from pedophilia to having killed nine or ten people. In the case of Jim Hosefi, former president, who was running for Senate, there were fake news saying that she had killed nine people when she was a revolutionary and gave the names and the places which she were killed, in which none of that was true. And so there was an undercurrent, an underground communications that was going on in the elections, which we, we think, and I think scholars who study the elections will be able to understand more thoroughly, thoroughly later, affected the outcome. So in the first round, the lead candidate was Jair Bolsonaro, former army captain, who uh, was alleged was uh, imprisoned for two weeks for insubordination, and then later alleged to have been involved in a bombing plot to pressure the army to give in to some demands of the non-commissioned officers, and was retired with full pay, ran for the city council of Rio, and then was a federal congressman, and had become known in the Congress for his intransigent kind of vir uh, kind of vitriolic uh, language in the Congress. He ran on a party which had very little base of support in the Congress and in the first round won 46 percent of the votes. And I'll come back to him a little later. Against Fernando Haddadji, who was the candidate of the Workers' Party uh, with an undergraduate degree in law, a master's in political science, and a PhD in philosophy, and a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. And Ciro Gomes, who is, was a former governor and a former minister in the Lula government, uh, who ran on the Democratic Labor Party ticket. There were three other candidates who did very poorly in the election and which indicated that there had been a reshuffling of politics in Brazil because in, traditionally the two main parties were the Workers' Party and the Party of Social Democracy, which tended to run in the runoff elections over the previous elections. And this time, a former presidential candidate who had run in the past in the runoffs, who was the governor of, of the state of Sao Paulo, uh, representing this party, did extremely poorly with 4.7 percent of the votes. The party, the representative of the party that the Brazilian Democratic Movement, which was kind of the largest centrist party in the country, former minister of the economy, uh, only got 1.2 percent. And then Marina Silva, who has been 
an environmental activist, uh, a minister of the environment in the Lula government, uh, had resigned and criticized policies of the Lula government, and had in the previous elections been a close runner-up, getting 19 and 20 percent of the votes, uh, really shrank her support and got only one percent in the first round. And so as you see here, a pattern that the majority of people who voted for the Workers' Party on the left were in the north or part of the north and the northeast of Brazil, which historically has been one of the poorest regions of the country and where the social programs of the Workers' Party had had most impact. And so in the second round, the outcomes were Bolsonaro receiving 55.2 percent of the votes and Hadaji 44.9 percent of the votes. If you analyze those statistics more, and perhaps some of our panelists will do that, we'll see two things. One is, again, the same pattern of the north and the northeast favoring Haddad over Bolsonaro and uh, giving him significant support. It's the area of the country where he really carried. And if we look at the numbers, while in terms of the vote, official vote results, the valid votes gave uh, Bolsonaro 55 and Haddad 40, almost 45 percent of the votes. But if we look at the other votes that are included in this, including blank votes, or when people went and refused to vote for any candidate, or people who refused to vote, we have a different kind of outcome in that Bolsonaro has 57 million, almost 58 million people supporting him, Haddadji about 47 million people supporting him, but there are 42 million people who either uh, did not vote properly or refused to vote for a candidate or abstained from voting or didn't participate. So while it is true that Bolsonaro won a majority in the runoff of, of, of votes that are counted, if we look at the entire electorate, the voting electorate in Brazil, um, only a minority of the people support him. And that's an important thing to consider, I think, in this election. So I'm just going to run through about five or six points that Bolsonaro has made as part of his electoral campaign and his tradition as being in the Congress for over 25 years. So he has a long record of making a lot of public statements. And the question will be whether he will carry out his electoral promises or not. This has been a debate in Brazil. Many people said he was hard when he was a candidate and he, was, he will probably move to the center. And other people say, no, he probably will stay maintaining the policies and the ideas that he defended and has defended over the last 25 years. And I think we have an experience in this country with Donald Trump having had a very sharp uh, rhetorical set of positions in the electoral campaign and then we can evaluate whether he has actually abandoned all those and have moved to the center or not in the United States. So one of the first things that uh, he promised to do was to invite Paulo Gages who was trained at the University of Chicago among a set of economists known as the Chicago Boys, who really believe that the economy will be uh, uh, improved by opening up to foreign investment, eliminating regulations and encouraging uh, capital from abroad and from, the, uh, from Brazil to be able to help grow the economy. And if we look at the classical policies of the Chicago School of Economics led by Milton Friedman, we see that while this does happen, there tends to be a much more growing gap between the rich and the poor as a result of these policies. He has embraced Paulo Gage's ideas and has given him uh, a role of being in charge of several uh, parts of the government which were in different ministries in forming a super ministry. Secondly, he has chosen for his Minister of Defense a member of the armed forces. And this is only the second time since the return to democracy in 19. 89 that the president has chosen a military leader to head the Department of Defense. Michelle Temer, who replaced Dilma Rousseff when she was impeached, did the same. And this breaks the tradition of having a notion that civilians should oversee the military in Brazil. Uh, one of the things uh, that we're familiar with in this country are people who are Holocaust deniers. They deny that the Holocaust existed. They say it was all a forgery, it's a fake. And in fact, I think one can make the argument that Bolsonaro is a military dictatorship denier. He denies on one hand that the dictatorship was there or it was bad. He denies that there was censorship. And then at the same time, when people talk about torture and the way that torture was used in the military regime, to not only extract information from oppositionists, but also to create a climate of terror. He argues that, in fact, one of the errors of the military was to not kill people and only torture them. So he has a contradictory discourse around the military, 
uh, regime, but clearly will be pressuring the country to reevaluate the legacy of the military and actually say that the military wasn't that bad. And he reflects a certain nostalgia, which he is legitimizing, about a notion that it wasn't so bad under the military regime. Um, he also um, has declared that he is going to be a hard law and order person. So um, those of us who study Brazil know that the issue of torture did not emerge during the military regime, but this was a practice of elites in the country since slavery and the torture and the abuse and the killing of millions of Africans who were forcibly moved to Brazil persists today in the treatment of prisoners, people who are allegedly accused of crimes. And in fact, one of his policies will be to, uh, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute more, will be to really upgrade uh, a law and order approach to solving uh, problems of crime and violence in Brazil. And one of the ways to do that was to announce that he, in fact, was appointing Sergio Moro, the person who had been involved in the investigation of corruption, to be a super minister of justice in Brazil. And um, for some observers, this is a very strange uh, um, gesture because Moro was the person who pushed for the indictment and the conviction and pushed for the uh, 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 hastening of the appeal so that Lula would be ineligible to run in the elections should the, if the appeal had uh, confirmed the conviction. And so people are saying, well, he seemed to have done the work of the government or Bolsonaro to really hasten the elimination of one of the candidates for public office in the election, and then he is rewarded by becoming the Minister of Justice. And he is a low-level judge. It's not as if he is a high-career person who had reached heights of in the judicial administration. So this is something that's very alarming um, because of that decision. And it's also alarming because the Congress that has been elected, and I'm not going to have time to go into the composition of the Congress, tends to be a more conservative Congress, although a relatively weak one. Um, the traditional form of getting support in the Congress when, if there are 38, if there are 35 parties or 28 effective parties, you need to bargain with the different political parties and you exchange a position in the government for their political support. It seems that it's going to be harder for Bolsonaro to do that, and I think he'll be have more difficult time in getting certain kinds of consensus in the Congress. But that time will tell on that. Also, the judicial system, which um, uh, has been strengthened in the last 30 years. I'm very concerned that it's not going to be able to be up to par with res resisting tendencies to want to eliminate democracy in the country uh, in the way in which the Supreme Court has not only intervened actively in political affairs, but in a lot of ways has not adjudicated, at least in my assessment, in a fair way, an even-handed way on many of the serious issues that have, been, have arisen in the last few years. So what are some of the issues that are going to be on the table in Brazil? The first one, and it's actually a proposed law that's in the, in the Congress at this moment. Uh, we don't know how to really translate it well in the United States. It's Escola uh, Sem Partido, school without a party or a nonpartisan school, but that doesn't seem to capture it. It's basically a, a right-wing movement arguing that university professors and school teachers carry their own political ideology into the classroom, and we need to eliminate this by preventing any indoctrination of students uh, in uh, their educational process. And this is an example. There's an, a, a debate going on here, and the people from uh, uh, this movement have come in and trying to prevent the person from speaking, as if this movement would come in tonight and try to silence us from speaking. And there's a law that is in Congress to approve this. It was uh, kind of not allowed to proceed last week. It is thought that it will be approved uh, or be taking up for a vote in the next two weeks. It's been approved in many municipalities in one state, and the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional. So we're not sure where this will go. And some people say, well, you know, shouldn't schools be neutral and shouldn't professors offer no ideological ideas? But to understand the logic of this, one of the things that they argue, and you'll see it here in this protest, is this gender no, because what they're arguing is teaching the category of gender the notion of gender as a category of social analysis, which in every class at Brown University, if you're not talking about race, class, and gender, you're really not doing your job. And this is something that they want to eliminate from all curriculums, from uh, the 
early years and elementary school to the university. And it has a double-edged sword. It's a critique of feminism and the women's movement. It's also a way to critique LGBT, LGBTQ plus ideas in Brazil by making this argument. Secondly, he has, he has promised to shoot to kill of anyone who's allegedly a criminal or inv in involved in criminal behavior uh, without any investigation afterward. In other words, if a police does kill someone, there's no need to have any uh, re uh, 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 consideration or review of that, uh, that, that killing uh, at any later date. It's to give impunity to, uh, to the police. And so what this is meaning in Rio de Janeiro, and I just talked to a friend of mine, 72-year-old woman, she is now afraid to walk around with an umbrella because just last week, a young black man having an umbrella was killed because the police argue that he had an, a gun. And so um, uh, if this is p provision is passed, it will also mean that people will really be worried that the police will have no restraints on immediately firing and killing people because they'll, p they'll, they'll pay no consequences if, in fact, they make a mistake. Uh, the, the other proposal that he has is to expand the possession of firearms so that everyone can have a firearm. There is a large proliferation of illegal guns and heavy-duty armaments in Brazil, many of which are controlled by gangs and criminal uh, agent, uh, organizations in the country. And the solution is to bring guns to everyone in society. So let's expand the number of guns that people can legally have so that, hey, here tonight, 10 or 15 of you could have guns. And if you didn't like what I said, who knows what might happen. Or if we get into a fight or an argument, you might pull it out. This is very alarming to a lot of people in Brazil. There's been a significant increase in the last year, and especially since the end of the electoral campaign on attacks of LGBTQ people. This is a, a problem in Brazil for a long period of time. But since the election of Bolsonaro, there have been a d decided increase in gay bashing and attacks on people. Gay men and lesbians who felt really comfortable walking hand in hand down the streets are refusing to do that anymore. They're really in terror, and this is not an exaggeration. I've talked to lots of people in Brazil who've expressed that to me. Bolsonaro has also shifted in his foreign policy. I don't want to go into the details. There are two things that have, have occurred. One is seeing himself as Brazil's Donald Trump and really finding himself and feeling himself very aligned to the Trump administration, and also Against the best judgment of the majority of the Jewish community in Brazil, he has agreed with Trump's policy of moving the Brazilian embassy to Jerusalem and also uh, either eliminating or moving the Palestinian uh, representative body, the, uh, the Palestinian uh, embassy, from a, away from where it is in Brasilia or perhaps closing it down altogether. And this is not, as I said, it's not a, a major demand of the Jewish community. It's actually a major demand of the evangelical Christians, who have grown in the last 32 years to be 25 to 30 percent of the population. Most of them are not your mainstream Protestant groups, but they're evangelical and Pentecostal religions. They've accumulated a lot of social support and now political power. They own the large, second largest uh, television and uh, media empire, Record. Uh, this is um, uh, one of the churches among many called the Igreja Universal Reino de Deus, which has tremendous influence. The Assembly of God uh, in Brazil has, has a long tradition among many tens of thousands of organizations. And so to end, I wanted to say two things. Those people who are very concerned about uh, the situation in Brazil are starting to coalesce in a movement to defend democracy in Brazil, defend human rights, defend academic freedom. Uh, this is a movement that, to a certain extent, emerged out of demands by students who are in this room here at Brown to sign a first petition against Bolsonaro before the, the second round in the elections, which got over 1,300 signatures in 38 states and 200 colleges and universities in the United States. There's going to be a meeting in New, uh, New York on December 1st for this movement to expand to defend democracy in Brazil. It's an open meeting. Anyone interested in going down to New York should talk to, to me or to someone else who's involved in this process. Uh, it'll be held at the Columbia Law School all day Saturday, December 1st. And with this overview, and I hope I didn't go too long, I'm going to call on Ramon Stern to share his thoughts with us. Um, thank you to Jim for the invitation to speak at this teach-in. 
Some of the points that were already made will be repeated in my talk a little bit. Um, I'm grateful to you, Jim, and the entire community here in, um, at Brown University of Brazilians and folks concerned with Brazil that is being built every day on this campus. While I am not Brazilian myself, I feel just as devastated by the results of the second round of the Brazilian elections on October 28th, 2018, as I did by Trump's victory in 2016. I'm still coming into an understanding of the magnitude of what has happened in Brazil. Thank you to all for attending on the eve of the United States midterm elections, which I know may be on your mind at this time. Um, the election of Bolsonaro has repercussions that extend far beyond Brazil's borders. So while trying to understand Brazil's internal reality tonight, this fact is important to keep in mind. Um, Bolsonaro's rise in, in some significant ways mirrors that of Trump, specifically in that very few believed initially in his chances at winning. At first he was a marginal politician, he had his extremist views, and had limited following. Um, he dedicated his vote in the impeachment proceedings of Yuma Josefi to a brutal torturer, General Ust Coronel Ustra. And um, his popularity grew astronomically over a short time, I would say largely by means of social media, fake news, and misinformation. Um, he was also, another tidbit is that he was endorsed by Steve Bannon, and David Duke, and was connected, as, as Jim mentioned, to a scheme of infiltration of WhatsApp groups by entrepreneurs in Brazil, spreading misinformation to favor him in the election. Um, he also refused to debate his opponent, Hadaji, before the, before the second round and off, even, even around the first round. He refused to, to debate. Suffice it to say that also that quite a combination of interest groups and ideological orientations voted him in. It's a very complex process to try to understand. Um, among them would be business community, evangelicals, and many other segments of the population. But um, to try to count for all of this surpasses the scope of this presentation. So I'm not going to try and I'm also not an expert on this, to on this topic. So let me start with a tangent. I lived in Chile, my mother's native country, from 1996 to 97. During the time I spent there, I heard both justifications for Pinochet's persecution of Chileans and personal testimony of torture from survivors. Back in 1998, Jair Bolsonaro, Brazil's current president-elect, said the following about Pinochet's dictatorship. Pinochet should have killed more people. So from that quote and many other quotes, including ones justifying torture, Bolsonaro glorifies torture and political persecution from the period of right-wing dictatorships throughout Latin America. And throughout his political career, Bolsonaro has spared no one in his hate speech, his brutal dehumanization of black Brazilians, women, indigenous people, LGBTQ folks, and so on. This I am sure many of you are well aware of. But Jair Bolsonaro's rhetoric is much more than just rhetoric. It has led to a spike in hate crimes and hate speech by his supporters all across Brazil. Um, over At least over 100 um, attacks were reported um, leading up to the election, mostly by Bolsonaro supporters of LGBTQ folks, of black folks, of, of, of people also displaying or mentioning that they had voted for the, the Workers' Party in the first round, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while this violence is not new, Brazil has an ongoing genocide against black youth, astronomical rate of killings of LGBTQ communities, genocidal violence against indigenous communities, and assassinations of political leaders, which existed long before this election. This violence will and has escalated due to this Bolsonaro presidency and increased during, increased during the election. So under his presidency, it will increase, and it has already increased. Just a few examples. Groups of violently homophobic Brazilians are gathering to intercept and beat LGBTQ folks. I've heard reports of this from friends in Brazil. Black people are being told publicly they will be exterminated at the same time as military police continue terrorizing communities in the periphery. And Bolsonaro recently retweeted an image mocking um, the black man who was a waiter who was killed with the umbrella. It, it was an image of a, a, a group of, of young black men holding, holding guns and saying something about umbrellas. And he retweeted this. And this is the president of, of Brazil that will, will be taking office. Attacks on indigenous people already began. And ranchers are poised to take over Amazonian preserves and de demarcated indigenous lands for cattle ranching. Now that Bolsonaro will be combining the Ministry of the Environment with the Ministry of Agriculture. 
students are recording left-leaning teachers classes and calling it communist indoctrination. This is already happening even before the vote on the Escola Sem Partido. And uh, so some friends of mine who are teachers are absolutely terrified um, by, by what's going on already. And prior to the second round of the elections, um, military police were temporarily sent with official sanction of, of electoral courts to storm universities, interrupt anti-racist, anti-fascist, and other events resisting the rise in hate speech and authoritarianism. Even post-election, teachers are being in, have been interrogated and have had materials confiscated across Brazil. The tense political climate today in Brazil is reminiscent of the time when there was a wave of right-wing dictatorships in the region. It is a revival of a reactionary discourse and reveals the deeply conservative underbelly of Brazilian society that has always been there, but often goes so unnoticed by the foreign media. All these developments most certainly point to the fragility of democratic institutions in the country and that Brazil is both a young democracy, as some people say, and an uneven and unequal democracy to be certain. Nevertheless, as I am far from an expert on Brazilian political institutions, I'll be taking this talk in a different direction partially informed by what the United States has witnessed over the past two years. So the United States, a democracy with supposedly, supposedly much stronger institutions than Brazil, has been watching rights be eroded and gains be dashed in a very short period of time, all within, quote, formal democratic institutions. Our representative democracy um, also serves in, in, at moments to legitimize Trump's policies and administration and normalize his fascism. He does not commit his atrocities and attacks on segments of the population just in spite of democracy or in spite of democratic institutions. Rather, he uses these very institutions as a means to legitimize his power and what most of us in this room would consider anti-democratic. So in the case of Brazil, what does this mean? I will start by posing a question, maybe a bit of a provocation. What if there is not as much of a contradiction as we may think between Bolsonaro's authoritarianism and Brazil's representative democracy in which so many people's participation and the institutional impact um, is, is, is limited to, 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 to elections. In other words, the representative aspect of democracy. In other words, for now in the interim, I'm less concerned about a return to a full-fledged dictatorship and much more concerned about the use of what are supposedly democratic institutions to install a fascist neo-dictatorship in Brazil with deep ties to the military and reactionary forces. The, if we look at the impeachment proceedings against Dilma Rousseffi, which were already a parliamentary coup, and, and, and we look at the judgment against Lula, which it, by, all, by all judgments in my view was a, was a farce the way that it was conducted, and many other forms of political maneuvering technically being allowed under, quote, democratic institutions, supposedly democratic institutions, I feel that this will continue to take place. So as, and, and also, another caveat that's very important to mention is that marginalized groups in Brazil, black Brazilians, indigenous Brazilians, LGBTQ Brazilians, and others, and the world, in other parts of the world as well, know what is called democracy has a malleability to the needs of the ruling class. Whereas finding a way to fight back against repressive state practices requires superhuman levels of creativity by those already socially and economically vulnerable. So what much of what has happened in Brazilian politics since the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff and even before show that malleability of democracy, its multiple faces and potential for retrograde authoritarian policies that are simultaneously making use of democratic institutions and are deeply non-representative and non-democratic. So the democratic system in Brazil is a necessary and deeply flawed system fought for with blood, sweat, and tears. I'm not denying that. However, no one can afford to pretend any longer, and many already have been pointing to this, that democratic institutions don't necessarily work democratically or in, in a way that, that, that serves the interests of the larger population. The costs have been too high, and now they're even higher. And this is a political paradox, I think, that of, of our time that um, I feel that Brazil and the world are entering a period, Brazil in its post-democratic transition, where authoritarianism is not, in, not really antithetical to democratic institutions, or maybe more accurately stated, Brazil and many other countries with differing levels of different democratic institutions are witnessing a similar process, the implosion of representative democracy. Let me explain more. I'm not altogether sure that the answer to the Bolsonaro election is simply to solidify democratic institutions 
uh, especially representative democratic institutions. It has been clear to black Brazilians, poor Brazilians, indigenous Brazilians, Brazilians, and LGBTQ Brazilians for decades, for centuries, that democratic institutions will not protect them with the same efficiency as the economic privileges of the ruling classes, whiteness, and heteronormativity. Democratic institutions have a malleability. They should not be scrapped, God forbid, but they are malleable to the political climate of the moment and to the interests of ruling classes. Those of us who believe in some kind of progressive form of governance are caught in a bit of a quagmire. It's necessary to have representative democracy, yet we cannot pretend that a democracy predominantly based on voting cycles and the machinery of political party leaders will result in a participatory process that represents the will of the people. Right-wing fascist authoritarian population, populism, as we are witnessing in Brazil, is not necessarily completely antithetical to formal representative democracy. It is an enemy of participatory democracy rooted in rights and the actors in civil society, universities, and social movements, among others. But this distinction is crucial. I feel that the Brazilian left has put too much faith in the formal democratic process and its legislative, judicial, and other elements. In Brazil, these institutions are even more malleable and possible to manipulate than what we have witnessed in the United States. And that is a large part of what has led us to this current political situation. So on the eve of midterm elections here in the United States, I believe we are witnessing a democratic system in crisis in both Brazil and the United States, where voting is somehow supposed to remedy much deeper social problems. I hope that we will get some good results tonight in the United States. But the threat to democracy the world is facing will have to be remedied by much more than a ballot box. Thank you. Julio. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank Professor James Green and Ramon Sterm for this challenge to be here tonight discussing this important moment and, and historical moment in Brazil. The election of Jair Bolsonaro, a low rank Baixo Clero politician that has been representing the far right spectrum of Brazilian politics for almost three decades, to be the 38th president of Brazil, has captured the world attention, so, as you can see. The main newspapers and magazines worldwide of different ideological orientations have reacted to this fact mostly with apprehension. The world appears concerned about Brazilian democracy and the effects in its foreign policy. In Brazil, this is not different. Journalists, politicians, artists, among others, have expressed concerns about Brazil. The former president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, that had been reluctant to openly criticize the candidate, declared that president elected could jeopardize the Brazilian image abroad. Rubens Recupero, one of the most experienced diplomats in Brazil, stated that the proposals of Jair Bolsonaro can leave Brazil poorer, isolated, and despised. Therefore, Apart from the fact that Bolsonaro was legitimately elected, rising a tide of anti-corruption and anti-PT sentiment in the Brazilian society, those concerns about the young Brazilian democracy and the possible impacts in its foreign policy should not be neglected. The raw truth is that after more than three decades of reconstruction of the democratic institutions in the country, Brazilians are on the verge of inaugurating a reformed military captain that has been collecting a full array of anti-democratic, homophobic, and racist attitudes. Those surprising facts demand interpretation. There are many possible approaches to analytic address reasons and consequences of Bolsonaro's election. Tonight, I've chosen to bring, in this brief comment, some reflections on Brazilian foreign policy. 
So I will expose the facts in three parts, briefly. Candidacy proposals and post-election declarations, Brazilian foreign policy's main paradigms, possible impacts and perspectives. So first part, the president's proposals. In Liberal Social Party, Partido Social Liberal, PSL, government program, there was little room for foreign policy. No more than one page stuffed with generic ideas. This is the original document. And here, I brought some highlights what is said there. The fact would not be an exception in Brazilian political history, since foreign policy is not considered an important issue during presidential campaigns. However, despite the limited space reserved for foreign policy, Bolsonaro's program inflated one specific theme, ideology, even though this concept has been used in a very inaccurate way. The core criticism would be to condemn any act or thought labeled left, a thought and insistent attack on different shades of red. After elections, the tone has been sustained. So the early declarations from the president-elected supporters and his ministries have been, possible ministries, of course, have been received by some academics, scholars, and diplomats with apprehension and disbelief. In his first speech as a president-elected, Bolsonaro reserved some time for Itamaraty, Brazilian foreign ministry emphasizing his intention to remove ideology from Brazilian foreign policy. So in line with what had been said in the campaign, Bolsonaro and his supporters have been expressing their bitterness on Cuba, Palestine, Venezuela, Paris Agreement, Mercosur, and also airing dubious statements about China's role in Brazilian economy. Bolsonaro also manifested the wish, as Jean Professor Green said, to change the Brazilian embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. He also declared that he would like the Palestinian representation office to be moved far from the federal government house. Those group of statements were enough to bring displeasure and apprehension to some Arab states, China, environmentalists, and some South American neighbors. A concrete consequence was that the Egyptian government canceled a visit that Aloysio Nunes Ferreira, Brazilian foreign minister, would make this week in the Arab country. Those few examples signs that Bolsonaro foreign policy rationale seems to, constrate, I'm sorry, seems to contrast with basic principles of Brazilian foreign policy. So a little bit about the history. A panoramic view in Brazilian history would clarify the basic principles of the Brazilian foreign policy and contrast them with Bolsonaro's promises and claims, making explicit that if implemented, the country would experience a dramatic reversal in its conduct, which is not actually unprecedented, but has been proved to be inconvenient, unstable, and short-lived policy. From 1822 to the fall of the monarchy in 1889, Brazil struggled to be recognized as an independent actor in the international system, to create a centralized state, to reinsert itself in the international economic system as an agrarian country, and to maintain slavery as its main labor force political decisions considered necessary by Brazilian political elite to create and maintain its nationality and territory. From the proclamation of the Republic in 1889 to the so-called liberal revolution of 1930, more an elite conservative pact, Brazil had defended the interests of agro-exporters, sought international prestige, and pragmatically changed its diplomatic access from Europe to America. 
from the liberal revolution in 1930 to the end of the 80s, Brazilian foreign policy was told to seek its inputs for economic and social development. This plan was relatively successful since the country has been industrialized but failed to distribute wealth and build a more egalitarian society. The national developmentalist state faced its limits in the 80s as the new liberal wings convulsed the international system. From the 90s ahead, Brazil has been adjusting its foreign policy strategies, strategies sorry, still trying to be a full developed country. Its foreign policy has tried different approaches to counter the risks and take advantage of the international system. Searching for more or less autonomy, Brazil has been leaving ebbs and flows in its development project. This historical process created two basic schools of thought on Brazilian foreign policy, the autonomists and the, pra and the pragmatic institutionalists, both contrasting views of national interests and strategies to reach the goals of development, but also bring other interest groups to the Brazilian political arena, making more complex the Brazilian foreign policy decision making. Undeniable is the fact that Brazil has become one of the most articulated countries in the world, developing foreign relations in all continents with countries from different political, economic, and social orientations. The capacity has helped, or this capacity has helped to consolidate the basic paradigms or paradigms of Brazilian foreign policy. Here they are. The pacifism would consolidate a conduct based on principles of peace and avoiding conflicts. Juridicism advocated the respect of treaties and conventions. Self-determination and non-intervention radically opposed to intervention elsewhere for fear of legitimizing possible alien intervention in its own system of power. Realism and pragmatism would give low political and extremely high economic density to the nation's international relations. Using those basic principles combined with universalism, meaning search for autonomy and avoiding automatic alignments, Brazil for Brazilian foreign policy went searching for opportunities and inputs for its development, such as investments, loans, consumer markets, technology, and energy. All that said, what would be the main perspectives of Bolsonaro's policies? As seen in this brief exposition, despite the fact that it is still premature to anticipate the complete agenda of Bolsonaro's foreign policy, the real struggle among interest groups in Brazil is already in course. For sure, contrasting readings of the national interests are being debated. A clear paradox stands out. The neoliberal concepts of his economic team and the nationalist beliefs of the Brazilian army, both groups to be sheltered in this future government. Yet, the initial signs suggest precautions, since it could imply Restraint of universalism toward sorry, that's it. a more bilateral and restrictive approach to its foreign policy, disarticulation of a large structure of contacts without any solid group of principles to be put into place, deterioration of Brazilian image and credibility worldwide since multilateralism institutions and Brazilian treaties has have been questioned and condemned. Lose ground in international trade if effective politics to adjust Brazilian markets to global competition were not implemented. Here there is much debate on this topic. Also, redirect Brazilian foreign policy to a narrow and limited perspective of automatic alignment sound not just anachronic, but rather irrational since it, it has been proved to be inadequate for a social economic complex country as Brazil. As history unfolds, 
we will have a clear image of the chosen path to be implemented by Bolsonaro government. Here, I have just some graphs to show the complexity of the Brazilian market and how universalism helps to implement such policies. Finally, rests that Brazil, throughout its history, has had some order restraining freedom. Progress, some progress, keeping huge inequality. Those experiments kept the country lost in its way to development. Brazilians should struggle to reinforce its democratic, its, democ its democracy, bringing freedom and, inequality, and equality together. We have a tremendous work ahead. Thank you. Ana Carolina. Good evening. My name is Ana Carolina. Ana Carolina, I'm a master's student in the graduate program in social, social science at PUC Rio. Uh, I would like to thank Ramon Stern and James Green for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And I also want to thank my Brazilian friends who helped me with some ideas. I'm not a specialist in the theme of elections or of politics. And I'm still studying to become a sociologist. And my speech is based on my experience as a black intellectual woman, a young social scientist. My talk will be short because I wanted to point some challenges that I think are important and let some questions for us to think together even we don't know exactly what will happen with Brazil, as Julia just said. There are so many things to say about the Brazilian election and about the president elected. After the invitation, I was wondering which one I would like to point here today, because as I see, we will face many challenges, but I would like to speak about one in particular, communications, and we can speak about this in many ways. I have some concerns about what will happen with Brazil after the election of Jair Bolsonaro. During the campaign, we faced big conflicts. People who were against Bolsonaro were called socialists and communists. These words were used as a pejorative term <laughs> Uh, through the WhatsApp, the numbers of the news were insane, and due to the number of contradictory news, it was difficult to know what was true or not. And now, we face another challenge. Even when we have proof uh, about some misconduct, misconduct uh, it is common to hear from who supports him that it is fake news. The lack of confidence in the news is dangerous because now we face people don't know what is true, what is not. The other point that I would like to say, it's about the challenge uh, to humanities disciplines. The president elected already demonstrate his lack of sympathy for the humanities and during the campaign, the intellectuals from the left suffered verbal attacks and were also called communists. I believe there is a misunderstanding and lack of information about the work of intellectuals from the humanities. I believe that during this government, we will need to create some strategies and actives and go beyond the walls of the university and talk to people about our work and why we did our research and why they are important. We can't take for granted our importance, our work, our research. We need to improve our communication with people 
who aren't in the academy. As intellectuals, our most important source of communication is writing. But we are facing a society in Brazil who reads less every day. So I believe that now imagination, it is important to create uh, other ways of communication. I believe that the most of the people who use the words like socialism and communism don't know exactly what they mean. They only associate this with the left and say that, that is bad, almost the devil. So, as we can see, there is a lack of understanding of the concepts that are being used. Another obstacle that I think we have to we have, it is how to talk about politics in a country that people believe that soccer, religion, and politics are not subjects of discussion. In Brazil, we have these expressions that means that we shouldn't discuss because they, they are subjects that will result in conflict. So how can we discuss politics? How can we show that politics is something beyond the election? It's not the act of voting. I said this just to remember that we have to bring culture into the equation. We cannot think only the politics. We have to think the politics and the culture of Brazil together. The president-elect already said that he wants to change many of affirmative actions, policies. Uh, he affirms that these policies increase the racial prejudice, for example. During the campaign, we heard many people that agree with him and sometimes say that the affirmative action is a privilege, not a right. People think that these policies are somehow talking away their rights. In addition of the structural racism, this is also the result of the lack of clear communication for people to understand the purpose of these policies. And as Ramon said, the black folks, the indigenous folks, the LGBTQ community folks, the LGBTQ community, sorry, um, are murder, murder in Brazil every day. So, and the president, as Julio said, has some, this, <coughs> some arguments, racist arguments and sexist arguments. So, with all this, I believe they covered everything. I want to say that even with all this happen, we have to remain optimistic and resist against every threat against our, democ our democracy and the human rights. Thank you for the attention. This last year, the Brazil section of the Latin American Studies Association did a survey among scholars of Brazil across the disciplines, asking which was the best program in the country to do Brazilian studies. And we're very honored to have been recognized by our colleagues as the best program in the country. And I think one of the reasons we're one of the best programs in the country is because we think about our Brazilian colleagues who are here at Brown. And we think of those people who care about Brazil, who are studying Brazil at Brown, and we've created a series of forums and venues for us to process what's going on. And I think this is one of the things we're doing tonight, understanding what's going on, sharing our information with people who are curious to know. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for discussion. We're going to do a tradition, again, in Brazil. We're going to take three or four questions, gather them together, and then we're going to let the panelists respond in any way according to the order they want to choose, and then we'll open for a second round. And feel free to leave if you have to go back and finish a paper. I see some of my students in class have things to do, so that's okay. But we'll, we'll continue until 9 o'clock. So if people are just planning their evening, that's what we're going to do. So um, we're open for questions. Nauco, first person, ask it. Thank you so much for this. Oh, wait, we want to have the microphone because 
we want to, this whole thing is re being recorded, so we want that to happen. Yeah. Thank you so much for his teaching. As um, Jim Green knows, I'm an Americanist, and so I'd just like to understand a little bit more about the voter who voted for Bolsonaro. So can you tell me a little bit more about him? For instance, we know about Trump that, you know, he drew a lot from, say, white folks who were making about $70,000 a year who felt like they could no longer live the American dream, that they felt that their standard of living was going down. And was there something, something more, is there something similar, I guess I'm asking, in Brazil, that they see some sort of, like, standard of living going down? That's part one. Part two is, like, why the resentment towards the left? Is it similar to the resentment of the left in the United States as well? Other questions? Yeah. Holly Case from the History Department. My colleagues are well represented tonight. Uh, thanks for this. Um, my question is about fake news because uh, in the United States, a lot of the stories about fake news are uh, somehow connected, at least in the reporting, to Russia. Um, and um, at least as as an origin point. I was wondering if there are any narratives about uh, who is producing uh, fake news in Brazil. We'll take a third question. Third question. Beatriz. Um, I really like Ana Carolina's point about how uh, people in academia sometimes become isolated from society. Uh, I totally agree that like this anti-communist speech in Brazil, I, it was something constructed that I wonder how it was constructed and why people are buying it so easily. Because the policies of the left when they were in power, were not communist or socialist, doesn't make any sense. And I, I have the impression that maybe the, the situation that we are living right now is a result of a lack of discussion about sensitive topics in Brazilian schools. Like, I think there was not enough emphasis in basic education on what the military dictatorship really was. Who was actually being murdered? What, what was exactly going on there? Uh, we superficially learn about it in school, but I think it, it lacks depth. And this is why, like, 30 years later, people are asking for the return of the military dictatorship. Um, also, about racism. I think Brazilian people are not like equipped to discuss about race or to identify racism the way they should. Um, so one of the things that uh, Bolsonaro posted on his Twitter or Facebook page was that, oh, my rivals t tried to claim that I am racist and this speech doesn't make any sense because the Brazilian people are miscegenated. And uh, yeah, that, that idea that like, oh, there is no racism in Brazil because our people are mi mixed. Um, I know, like at least when I was in school in Brazil, um, uh, the uh, the teachers would always like not tell us to use the word race and to say that like oh that we are just like different ethnic groups and there is no race and I think people became like unable to identify racism. Um, I th I think like similar parallels could be made to LGBTQ rights that like people didn't discuss enough about that they were not taught enough about that and maybe like for people who had more access to education it becomes easier to identify racism it becomes easier to identify uh, attacks to LGBTQ rights uh, but not so much for the uh, poorer population and something that is like really hard for me to understand is why uh, low income people were voting for Bolsonaro. Um, why were they like? Th there was like a, a cartoon about like, there was a, a cattle, uh, like a, a cow with a uh, holding an, a, a knife, writing like Bolsonaro, like we love Bolsonaro, like it's basically, okay. yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Um, yeah, so my, sorry, I think I talked too much. <laughs> my question would be like, how we would bridge that lack of uh, access to? speech that is so obvious for people who are in academia into the basic education system in Brazil. And how we, can, we could do that in this current situation where the, uh, edu the education system is probably going to become more and more conservative. Okay. So we'll let anyone on the panel speak at will, and I will also have the right to speak as, as well as one of the people. Whoever wants to speak first. 
Okay. You can address any or none of the questions. <laughs> um, about the... Oh, sorry. About the racism and why people do not talk about this in Brazil, it's true that even 55% of our population are black and people still think about this and about the miscegenation. We do not have um, racism and that's a lie. Uh, this this speech about that we live in a racial democracy was increasing during the for the second because the first one was the with the Getulio Vargas, but the second dictatorship in Brazil, who said that different from the American, the United States, in Brazil we do we don't have this. And this discuss will getting stronger. So now we are facing all the difficulties that we have, especially with the action, aff affirmative actions about the black community, because people say that there is no reason to have because we do not have racism in Brazil. I don't know if I answer you what you said. Even when I was a, a teenager and was in high school, yes, you're, you're right. People do not talk, talk about race in Brazil because it's not a subject. Uh, about the return of the dictatorship, an interesting thing is in Brazil right now, many of the truth um, commissions about the dictatorships in different states of Brazil are working in show to the show the population about what happened in this period. I I can't answer the why people want the return of the dictatorship. The only thing that I'm remembering now it's about that the, the hate against PT, that the, this system will bring some order to our society. In Brazil, many people think that only a strong state will do the job. I don't know if I'm clear of the questions that you made, I believe these two I can answer. You please. <laughs> uh, I, I would make just a, a brief comment about race. I would say that Brazil, in its history, uh, when it was necessary to create a nation, race was like kept apart. In the 80s, when the monarchy was suffering from some uh, kind of a decentralization, in the 50s, the, there was one reaction project, and we have a all those myths of the Brazilian uh, uh, race or the, the people. So, and when you, when you consider that in the 50s, in order to create a nation, Brazil like, uh, hired some historians to write Brazilian history. They, even uh, writers uh, try to create this myth that the Brazil was one harmonic society. I think throughout history, you have many manifestations of those nation as the importance of the nation, uh, leaving aside or not trying to discuss the simple fact that Brazil was the last South American country to liberate slavery. And Joaquin Nabucco would say that this would be a long staying in Brazilian society. And it still is, because when you see that uh, Brazil lives in two, different, uh, in two different kinds of justice, one for middle class and high, high class, justice, it's not allowed to enter your home if without a, I don't know how to say this in English, but a petition, I don't know what, something that the justice, if you warrant, warrant. warrant. so 
But if you are in a favela, your house is like a free zone to go. Yes. So we live in a double standard society till today. If you consider the level of uh, killing or, or of uh, of uh, killings in this uh, this report just have released now, you see that uh, what part of the society is being exterminated and why. So these those are very uh, uh, important questions to be addressed. We still are compressing compressing this discussion. I think. History, we will face it. We will face Brazilians in order to, uh, to deal with this thing. It happens during Getúlio Vargas. Samba used it to be a criminal manifestation and elaborated like when uh, Brazilian uh, cultural symbol. What happened? The mystery of Samba. Yeah? So all those things, uh, I think it's important to discuss and the, in different levels, so I think it's important. And about the left, the age or what is happening there, I think there is one framing of generations because part of the of the thing of communism, I, I would say that now people are considering the PT time as one of the that would bring uh, disastrous consequences to Brazil. The other would be the backlash created by those politics of integration society. I think two, uh, because the levels of uh, uh, eleven uh, elevating the wait, wait, is it? So middle class uh, considered those uh, politics uh, very badly. So this would be those two combined with another another thing. But I'd like to um, express. Okay. okay um, I, I definitely agree with everyone about the isolation from society of academia and the lack of discussion of sensitive topics in Brazilian schools being an important issue and people not being equipped. But I think as well, those even those who have been exposed to conversations about racism and race, if you look in Brazilian universities and different places where those conversations are happening, because they're happening more and more in universities because of affirmative action policies, because of more and more um, black people being in universities, there's a backlash against it anyway. So I, I, while I agree that people need to be equipped to talk about racism, I don't think it's just a matter of receiving the education. I think that there's a backlash against it. I think that there's people are tired of hearing about it, and people don't want to discuss it because they don't want to face the reality of it. Um, so, so I think that's a really key aspect of understanding issues surrounding race in Brazil as well, is that, it, is that people don't want to discuss it because they don't want to face it. And that's a really, really imp important thing. It's not just that people have been miseducated. It's also, it, it's, it's also that people see all the evidence of it every day in front of them and choose to ignore it or choose to say that it's not a problem. Um, so so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to say. Um, as far as Bolsonaro voter profile, I think it's very complex. And um, I think even in relationship to Trump, there's a lot of debate surrounding what the profiles of, of, of Trump voters were. Um, as far as Bolsonaro goes, uh, there's clearly been in Brazil for a long time a resentment of, of elites, mostly, mostly white, in relationship to um, the policies of the Workers' Party that were able to make gains for, 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 for lower classes and, and for, for black Brazilians and for, for indigenous Brazilians and for other groups of people. Um, there's clearly been, been a a resentment. So that backlash, if you look at the numbers of states that elected Bolsonaro, for example, and you look at the Northeast versus versus South and Southeast, and you also look at a state, for example, like, I don't know, like Santa Catarina, for example, um, and, and see the numbers that are voting for Bolsonaro, they're very high. So there is a correlation between elite and white, elites and whiteness and support for Bolsonaro, no question. But there's also a huge segment of the population, the evangelical segment of the population, that not not all of who voted for Bolsonaro, but many of whom voted for Bolsonaro because he's he's claiming that he's governing using the Bible and other things of this nature, even though he's not an evangelical himself. Um, as far as resentment towards the left, it's it's I, I think it's been a long time coming in resentment towards the Workers Party that's been created by 
by media, it's been created by um, by frustrations of problems with uh, problems with economy of of violence of things different people are facing and anxieties people are facing and um, the 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 media in in Brazil is not is not very varied. There's not a lot of different perspectives on it. And a lot of people get get information a lot of information from the media, so it's easy to feed it. Also, fake news and and social media and all those kinds of sources have definitely have definitely fed into all of this. But I don't have an easy answer for for either of those questions. And there are there are definitely low income Brazilians who are voting for Bolsonaro, not only who are evangelicals. And so, understanding that process is going to be important to moving forward as well. Um, as far as fake news, I just wanted to quickly touch on that. Um, as far as the narratives about who is producing the, the fake news, I mean, I think there's a global phenomenon that's happening, but I, I definitely think that there's a level of, um, of of influence of what's been going on in the United States on some level. And um, like I mentioned, these figures from the U.S. that are tied to Trump are also supporting Bolsonaro, and there's, there's kind of these loose exchanges going on. I, I, I don't know if I would go so far as saying that there's outside outside sources that are that are in some ways feeding into it. I know that during the, the scandal with Bolsonaro during the election that was not truly investigated in relationship to the WhatsApp groups, um, that it was Brazilian entrepreneurs that were mostly behind it, but who knows who they're connected to, so I, I can't really answer that question easily. Um, I wanted to say something, and Anna Carolina wanted to say something, so por favor. Yes, por favor. just about what you said now, because I because the, was the first one. Uh, I don't know exactly how we can figure out this isolation of the academy, but I believe it's the point we have to solve this, this situation. And because of the, the race, there's one argument that's every that supports the all these idea in a class in a of high school I don't know basic school we have 30 students and one it's black so when you said that the black community don't have the access to the things no no there's one so people use this only one, maybe two, in a class in the in university to say that it's not a structural problem. It's the individual's problem. If uh, that, uh, that person she is black and it's sitting in a university, you are not, it's for the other black, the other folks of the black community, of black folks, you are not because you are not able to do. It's your problem. It's not a structural problem. So that's one argument that I want to point that is extremely important. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to also follow up and some, see if I can help answer Nako's question and Kali's question and, and respond to Beatrice a little bit. This is so complex. I teach a whole course on this. And so to try to do it simply and, and concisely is compl complicated. We don't fully yet know, Nako, as you asked about, and, and Ramon pointed out exactly who the bases are. People are trying to figure this out now. It's a very new phenomenon. It was took people by surprise. He really rose in the polls, and we thought he had a, a ceiling for the uh, rejection ceiling that would prevent him from getting a majority. But the, clearly, the core base of support is white middle class people, which is a fairly large portion of the society, and especially in the last 25 years. And they're particularly upset by the way in which the Workers' Party has stripped all of the privileges that they've had as legacies of slavery. So all middle class people in Brazil, from lower middle class to upper class, always have a maid. Children of these middle class people never wash dishes, never make their beds, never do anything. They have a very privileged life, which is unusual, which Americans going to Latin America see as somewhat unusual. Uh, because it, the patterns of that kind of indentured servitude are different than they are there. And so when, for example, when Jim Hosefi finally got a law passed that gave uh, maids rights and gave them uh, benefits and vacations, it meant that people couldn't afford the maids that they had, the cheap labor, and they were very resentful for this. 
Now, on the other hand, um, some people who work as domestics have made the argument, and I think it's, a, it's complicated, that in allowing for this labor laws to exist, they have stripped them the possibility of, of getting employment because people won't hire them. But that's, that's kind of the counter argument that's made. But basically, a series of social movements pressured the government and the Workers' Party embraced many of these to ch radically change certain structures. And I think the one that Ana Carolina points out is the most important is that in federal universities, which are free, now there is a quota system where 50% of the students have to be of color, of indigenous background, or of public schools. The public schools are generally not as good as private schools, so you send your kids to a private school if you're wealthy, they pass the entrance exam to the university, they get a free college education. Poor people don't have good schools, they go to public schools, they're not as good. They don't get into the, the public uh, schools, they end up going to private schools if they want to get a degree, paying a lot of money in tuition. So this, this notion that the privileges of the middle class is lost is, is tremendous. The second point is that uh, we're, we're not, there's so many things to talk about, we haven't been able to address as fully as we could the fact that indeed the Workers' Party in state power was involved, sectors of it, portions of it were involved in corruption, especially people appointed by the Workers' Party to be in certain entities in the government. And this uh, was upsetting to many people in the society, and the media played this for as much as it could. And so it created a very anti-politicians, which is why the center-right parties also were kicked out and a kind of a maverick from the far right elected um, to power. Um, I think that the, the, the remnants of the Cold War and anti-communism and anti-socialism are there. It's a very uh, comfortable rhetoric to, uh, to take and use in the 21st century, even though Brazil in no way, shape, or form is any more socialist than is Germany or France or Great Britain uh, at this moment, but it's used as a, as a fear and to mobilize people. Um, so just there are many more reasons for that, but I think there's the question of the crime and violence and the fear that people have around that and thinking that somehow giving everyone a gun is going to solve the problem of violence uh, or crime. These are easy solutions for complex problems that Bolsonaro has offered to people. And I think a lot of the support that he has is soft support. Um, I still insist that the population of Brazil is 33% left, 33% uh, centre, 30%, 33% right. And the left got 45%. They got a, a left core. And they also got 10% of the, of the vote of people who really were so appalled by Bolsonaro that they chose to vote for the Workers' Party, even though they weren't really necessarily supportive of many of its factors. And many people in the middle and on the right kind of coalesced around Bolsonaro, but I think this sector in the middle could easily shift, especially if he doesn't uh, fulfill, uh, solve any of the economic problems, the 12% unemployment and other uh, economic problems that the country is facing. And finally, about the question of fake news and social media, um, m more people have iPhones and cell phones in Brazil than in the United States in, in terms of percentage of the population. Um, and people use it all the time, and it's the most important form of communication. Uh, they basically use WhatsApp to talk to everyone. One of the problems is that the plans that you get when you use WhatsApp are expensive. So instead of getting a, 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 an article and going and deep reading the article, you just read the headlines, because if you download it, it's going to use your time. And so there's a superficiality. Um, and whereas Trump relied on Facebook and the bubbles within Facebook to generate support, and that's something that it's a little bit more transparent to control and to identify and even identify Russian hackers. What's up is basically you get a message and you just pass it on to your friends and you have their telephone number, but there's no way to control that or it's a very complicated way to control that. I think that most of the material was produced by the campaigns and people connected to the campaigns. We don't know yet whether there was foreign intervention. Likely there was, and as Ramon pointed out there, uh, although companies are not allowed to participate in the campaigns and spend money for the campaigns, clearly millions of dollars were spent in the last two weeks by certain entrepreneurs who wanted Bolsonaro to win, and they invested millions of dollars in sending hundreds of millions of messages um, to everyone. Uh, and so this was, um, I wanted to say one last thing that uh, is just connected to my own experience. I'm very well known um, as kind of a very outspoken person in Brazil and in the media. And I was invited to the Federal University of Rio in August. And I just got an email today from a colleague from that university who invited me to a talk saying that she had been sent an uh, inquiry by the Ministry of Education about the content of my talk in August in Rio. 
and they wanted to have more documentation, what was the poster, if there were taping of it, a filming of it. So even before Bolsonaro is in power, they're identifying people to investigate them. And um, I, I'm actually sharing this because I think we all should be aware of this and see if it's happening to other people so we can, we can be, you know, we can be uh, vigilant to that. This is causing this weird situation in Brazil where people are panicking and wanting to get off Facebook and social media because we're very exposed and at the same time saying, no, the one, one of the ways we're going to resist right now is to keep supporting each other and not being afraid to share our ideas and speak and to be taped tonight and to be transmitted who knows where so that other people can see that. So okay, let's take another round. Question here, question there, third one. Uh, I'm sorry if that was touched on before, but I, I would like to hear from you what you think about how Lula goes into the equation and even though he was like despite all the, the, the political uh, campaign against him by sectors of the media, most of the media, and sectors of the judiciary, uh, he was still ahead in the polls until he was, uh, I don't know, prevented from, from participating. Uh, and still, he seemed to be, to have been the, the, the greatest, or what he represents was one of the, the greatest arguments against the Workers' Party and that motivated that, that prompted uh, Bolsonaro to be elected. And, and, and how do you relate the role that he played uh, in Bolsonaro's election, even if unintentionally, and the, the task we have now to, 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 to keep uh, campaigning for, his, uh, for him to be freed from, from prison? Um, my question is about the violence, and so if police have permission to sort of indiscriminately shoot people, if they... This, this is a proposal he's making to allow that to happen. They okay. do it anyway, but it will be legalized, whereas now it's just informally done. So do you, what do you guys think is going to happen with the people that they're targeting? So the criminal organizations, this is supposedly to try to stop what they're doing, but I doubt that they're going to take it that way and lightly and sort of the proliferation of violence that's going to occur in specific areas where there's already a lot of violence um, and that, how that's going to play out. Hi, so uh, considering everything that has been said here about racism and I think could be extended to sexism and homophobia, and I would like to like bring up the fact that the left is not immune at all to this kind of things. Indeed, it's much is, is as contaminated as the general Brazilian society. So, thinking about this idea that we should have, we should work on a democratic front and all of that, and drawing from my experience as a social movements activist and knowing all the difficulties we have in like debating racism and debating sexism and debating homophobia and etc. 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 within the left. So I would like to hear a bit your thoughts about uh, what, what, how can we proceed with that, you know? So anyone can answer the, uh, the panel I'm in any order? I'm not trying to start. You go. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, I'm going to start with the last question. Um, the left is not immune to racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia at all. Um, I, we, we had a speaker here whose name is Douglas Belchior, who was barely not elected in, in Sao Paulo for, um, to, to Congress. And um, he openly criticized the PSOL, which is the, the, the furthest left party that, that has um, the, the party of um, so socialism and freedom. Or, mm -hmm. um, and and um, for their racism in relationship to candidates, black candidates and and, and other, other, um, other candidates that were not part of this kind of white elite that, that, that runs the party. And, um, and so I, th I think um, one of the things that's going to be really crucial, but it's, it's a huge fight and it's really, really difficult. I'm sure you know much more than me about this, but is, is, is that those, those, el those elites on the left that want to hold on to their own particular power within leftist parties and within are going to have to there's going to have to be real negotiations there's going to have to be real opening of those of those parties to 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 those who are at the base of social movements to 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 lead them more um, and that's not happening right now 
So, so the question is whether that will really, really happen at any point. But that, that fight has to continue because, because the left is not immune at all. And the, the left is it's the, the people con controlling many of the parties. They're, they're part of white elites as well. So it's, it's, it's quite clear that, that um, many of the same kinds of battles just within a different ideological structure and, um, are, are, are to be had within the left wing parties. As far as violence, police criminal organizations, I mean, I, I think it's, if you add on also the fact of people having access to firearms, if that actually happens, that would, that would be, that would be another added horrific um, factor. But, um, I mean, for, for the longest, military police and, 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 and other, other authorities that are, that are going into, into specific communities in the, in the periphery and committing violent acts against residents there it, it has not worked to reduce violence and, and increasing their, their presence or escalating it won't decrease violence. They'll, they'll, they'll just be more violent. So what I suspect is that, is that there'll just be, there'll be spikes in all kinds of violence as a result of, or as well as a result of that kind of a policy. Um, Lula, um, I mean that's that's a really good question. Um, he was ahead in the polls, and um, is a really really important figure in Brazilian politics. I mean the most popular president in history. Um, people remember his his years in power with with a lot of um, nostalgia, fondness. Um, not that he didn't make any mistakes, but but because the economy was strong, and in addition. <laughs> these social gains were being made. It was it was a real big deal to a huge part of the population, um, but I'm not I'm not sure whether I mean it's it, it's it's important to to mobilize around Lula and p people will continue to do so. But I'm a little bit pessimistic about what's about anything anything happening to to, to change the reality on the ground with, with Lula in prison. I think he's going to serve many years in prison. and um, He could be a rallying figure in the future for, for people on the left, even for more than he is now. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to change the equation, at least in, in the immediate future. You know. Let me add just one point in those uh, face, fake news question. I don't, She's gone, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. We're no, here. Just <laughs> because uh, I, I remember here. Because now in Brazil, formal knowledge is under attack. Like uh, people are saying, no, universities are places just to, to produce nothing good. You go, if you combine this with low uh, rates of education in Brazil, and a very concentrated uh, media system, you produce something horrible there. We've been, the source is uh, under attack too. You, are n you have n no certainty uh, what is a, uh, a source that would be reliable. So those combined in Brazil with this possibility to have one smartphone in your hand and shooting information with no Credibility is a is a weapon of mass destruction. I would say, <laughs> amazing. What's happening? Um, about what you said about the left and the racism. It was what I was talking about. Today we have the law in Brazil that racism is a crime, and now it's not allowed to speak what you think about this subject and every but racism is is structural we we grew up in a society in a racist society and sometimes we reproduce this discourse even we don't know that we are doing this uh, one thing that in brazil uh, Sometimes we divide at the good and the bad. And if sometimes you want to criticize the speak of someone, but not saying that you are a bad person, not this, but what you just said, it's a little complicated. People know, no, I'm not being racist. So 
as I said before, the conflict, the conflict. People don't want to speak about things that may uh, result in a conflict. People do not want to be associated with, with a bad behavior. Even if we are not talking that this person is bad, only to, we have to face, we have to, to see the problem so we can solve the problem. If we continue to say that racism doesn't exist, that everybody is racist but me, we won't solve this problem. It, it's a problem of the right, the left, it's society. It's the society, it's not the good or the evil. I want to, what is your name on the back? Julia. Julia. So Julia, I lived in Brazil from 76 to 82, and I happened to stumble into the left in an organization and many things when I was at the University of Sao Paulo. And I also was a founder of the gay rights movement in Brazil and its left wing. And at the time when the black movement was trying to articulate its ideas, when the feminist movement was trying to talk about its issues, when the LGBT movement at the time called the homosexual movement was trying to raise that question, the left, which became mostly the Workers' Party, had a very traditional Marxist idea that class was predominant. You know this. We're actually talking to other people in the room, perhaps. Uh, and, and what really I have noticed in the last two years, which is absolutely remarkable, is that discursively, which is a first step, everyone, including all of our speakers tonight, made sure they talked about sexism, racism, and homophobia. It's all a part of the... If Bolsonaro did only one thing positive, he unified a notion that there are multiple attacks upon people in society, in an unequal society, in a hierarchical society, and what he wants to do is to undo every positive thing that was changing the quality of life of women, of people of color, and LGBTQ people. Even though the left did it very partially in with some resistance at times, and was unable to do that. And you're absolutely right. All of these, and I agree with Ana Carolina totally, Brazilian society had slavery for 350 years. You have to create an ideology around that. You have to justify it. You also have to deal with the uncomfortableness about having slavery, so you cre create a series of discourses around that. And the one that the elites developed in Brazil is, we're not racist. We are congenial, we love each other, we're not violent, we're cordial, we're happy, we kiss each other, we're known for being fun-loving. These are all the stereotypes. And that is a wonderful way to mask and, ref and to silence the discussion around these questions because if we're not racist as a society, you don't have the right to raise these questions. If we're a tolerant society during carnival, we can't talk about homophobia, etc., etc. If we love our women and they're sexy and they're sensual and everything like that, how could there be anything bad about violence against women or in violence against women? So I think what's positive now, and I think, I think all the critiques that people are making are correct, but it's within a context of uniting and raising these questions within a united front, a democratic front, to fight a person who wants to undo every single gain that has been achieved in the process of democratization the end of the dictatorship in the last 30 years. And so it's not to say that people should not raise their voices and critique every manifestation, articulation of uh, uh, racist or sexist or homophobic or uh, hierarchical uh, attitudes, but it's, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, regarding, I think violence has been answered by several people. More guns is really going to solve the problem, right? Uh, <laughs> but the, <laughs> there was even a, like a, a cartoon between the first and second round where a person was in a in a parking lot and the guy blocked this woman in and he pulled out a gun and then his son pulled out a gun. Everyone pulled out a gun to shoot everyone else and they all killed each other. So to kind of show what it means. But the question of Lula, and it's a very important question, because on one hand Lula uh, engendered this love that Ramon talked about, but also he represents everything that changed in Brazil and he seems to represent all the corruption in Brazil, although the charges against him were pretty flimsy for the uh, the apartment he allegedly never received or owned, but allegedly gained. Uh, and I think that the reluctance of sectors of the Workers' Party during this campaign to talk about that, although there was one sector that wanted to do that, meant that in the beginning of the campaign, it was all about freeing Lula, and then there was another moment which it looked like, whoops, we're not getting the support we thought we would get from people who had supported Lula in the past. Whoops, Bolsonaro is surging in the polls. We need to have a different discourse 
and different question. And so Lula Livre, Lula, freeing Lula became a secondary question. I think now, and with the appointment of Moro as the Minister of Justice, who a person who said, we have no proof that he committed a crime, but we're going to condemn him anyway. He said that in his final statement for his conviction, indicates that it was a political trial. It was a maneuver to prevent the most popular person from being a candidate for the presidency. It was manipulated, and justice was not served. And so I think the demand for freeing Lula will be a very important part of a multifaceted, complex movement demanding democracy in Brazil. And because he was unfairly imprisoned. Uh, now, I think also there are going to be many other charges leveled against Lula and other people within the Workers' Party, because the goal of the government now the people who are in power is to destroy the Workers' Party and the left, to tear it from its roots, discredit it among the population, and destroy it institutionally and uh, ideologically, culturally, and emotionally. And on the other hand, 24, 25 percent of the population in a recent poll said that the party that they identify with is the Workers' Party. 45 percent of the population of people who actually voted, very clearly voted, uh, for Haddad, uh, whether, whether or not they like the Workers' Party. And so I think we have a large percentage of the population to work with um, to, uh, in this, co this, this context. I, I agree with Ramon. He's probably going to be in prison much longer than he deserves to be. But the other thing I know from teaching Brazilian history is you can never predict anything that's going to happen uh, <laughs> because it's the craziest history of any country that I know in terms of the, the twists and the turns uh, of, of what might happen. So I think we have um, just for one more last round, if people have further questions. It's not required. We might be all exhausted or wanting to run home and find out how the Democrats are doing in this country. I don't know. So if they're not, I want to thank everyone for coming. This is really wonderful. Come to our other events. We're glad to see you all. If you want to receive officially events of the Brazil Initiative, just send an email to brazil, with a Z, at brown.edu. Thank you very much. Thank you.